A couple things about reimbursement fundamentals as you go through your own planning. We always talk about kind of the three essential barriers you have to figure out. There's coding, whether or not there's a healthcare common procedure code that really describes the service um, or the manner in which physicians would use it. Coverage is that question of whether or not Medicare and third party payers will cover procedures your devices permit. And if so, under what clinical circumstances? And on payment, are physicians and hospitals going to be paid enough to encourage product adoption without being too expensive, thereby discouraging government and private insurers from covering it? And in a reimbursement assessment, I think anyone will say these are the three baselines you really need to account for in your plan. It was the uh, chief medical officer from United Health Group headquartered here in Minneapolis speaking to our Life Science Alley annual meeting in Expo three years ago. But he got up in front of 1,500 med tech executives. We're kind of used to getting this nice rah-rah speech, you know, for an opening comment at their big annual meeting. And he came up there and he told these people, we can't be seduced by all the wonderful technology toys and other stuff because every idea ain't good. And at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, does the technology work? Will it improve quality, help manage costs, be good for the consumer, and meet a real need? It kind of stunned the whole audience of 1,500 who, of people who just love their technology, have invested hundreds of thousands, not millions of dollars in it, and all of a sudden were kind of hit with this, like, yeah, you got all this stuff, but we don't need it, we don't want all of it, and you're going to have to figure out how you're going to sell it to me so we cover it for our multi-million dollars worth of members. And don't bring me technology that is comparable to what exists out there today and expect me and my staff to go through all this policy review time, figure out whether we should cover this new technology, which is so similar to everything else that's out there in the marketplace, and doesn't meet a real consumer need, doesn't help me manage costs, because you said your big problem in this country is managing health care costs. Don't bring me new technology that is just fits in here somewhere but doesn't help me manage costs. I don't have the time for it. And it was just a real awakening experience for these people. But it's kind of the environment that we're facing right now. Think about this. Um, we're dealing with the left arm and the right arm of the federal government. And medtech entrepreneurs have been dealing with the FDA for product clearance for many years. Understand it's a big challenge, but you're getting to sort of understand how it works. And when you work with the when you go through to clear your product, you do all these clinical studies among homogeneous group of patients who have the same disease. You isolate the fact that this is the only condition they have. You take your clinical experiments and you take them to the best universities and the best surgeons in the country to prove that your device does exactly what it's supposed to do. So you really isolate that treatment effect and you can demonstrate to the FDA that this product really is safe and effective. But then why in the world then won't Medicare and third party payers just automatically cover it? I guess I would pose that as an open question. I mean, think of it. The clinical trials happen at the best universities and medical centers and surgeons in the country. But your companies don't market to just those people. You market to every doctor and every surgeon, anybody who's going to buy the product, and they don't all get the same clinical outcomes that the best university centers in the countries do. And health plans know this. Medical directors know this. The variation in the real world is much dramatic, much more dramatic than in a controlled clinical environment. You have a clinically diverse group, you have doctors at all different levels of skill, you have physicians who even though you can't tell them that you can take this product and use it for off-label purposes, these are smart people, they know they can. So they'll take device cleared for one indication and use it for another because they think they can and they're practicing the art of medicine as well as the science. These are things that health plan medical directors have to think through all the time when they're trying to figure out if they're going to cover a new procedure or technology. So there are all these reasons why you've got two different sides of the coin. You need to figure them out really at the same time. Uh, a question for Ed. You mentioned you, you showed us the two triangles, one up and one inverted. And there's the FDA animal and there's the CMS animal. Um, and you talked briefly about how, how do we as manufacturers get our code used more or, or have uh, the third-party payers be more receptive 
uh, to it. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I put that under the heading of marketing to payers. Um, but you have to get into the mindset of what a health plan medical director worries about when a new technology comes out into the market. And it's like taking that advice that the product that Elizabeth was talking about and shooting for the world to have this um, apply to everyone with a related diagnosis. Or <coughs> Pat mentioned the type 2 diabetes market. It is huge. And if you think you can treat that whole market with your one new gadget and suggest something to a third party payer, that's a real fast way to get it denied. Um, because there is no device that works well for everybody. Um, you have to think incrementally. You have to think about explaining and encouraging to physicians the most appropriate use for that technology and suggest that you're going to work with you know, the clinicians and the users of your product to continue to use it within its defined clinical indication and not stray too far. Um, be clear and talk about how it replaces other technologies or other therapies, does not add to the cost, and add to the treatment continuum. Um, there are all kinds of things that people worry about. And in certain market areas, you know, if you take the Blue Cross system, these are plans that are pretty state specific. And these medical policy directors, they know how physicians in their state practice. And you may come out with a great new spinal fusion device, but if it's in a marketplace where a health plan medical director knows they've got a lot of aggressive neurosurgeons and their rate of doing spine fusion surgeries is twice the national average, they aren't going to let any new product out of the marketplace until they get a better handle on how physicians are using the device already. So it's being really sensitive, I think, to some of the local issues and trying to get in the minds of creating realistic expectations about you know, the populations that these uh, technologies can serve. But what is an answer that, that is, yes, I have a predicate, but I deserve more reimbursement because? Is there, is there a reasonable route to go to achieve higher reimbursement if you're not starting with a PMA? <clears throat> that might be more of an Ed question than mine because it's, it's the idea of, do we go out and fight for a new code or, or do we not? So that example that I gave of that, um, that surgical tool that used the RF energy, you know, they decided that it was gonna be much less burdensome to redesign and re-engineer their device so it used that than it was to go out and fight for a new code. And, you know, I've, I've just seen that it takes a lot of effort and a lot of years. We've got another customer who's fighting for a new code for a device that they're trying to put out. And I think they've been fighting for that code now for four years, I believe, and they haven't, I don't know if there's light at the end of the tunnel yet. So, you know, from my standpoint as a design engineer, it's like, well, what can we do to overcome that hurdle? Then maybe it's, maybe it's we design it so we still get the therapeutic benefit that we're looking for, and there's a unique way to design and engineer that. Um, so it fits under the old code, and that's my challenge. So I take that on as a design challenge and try to, and try to do that. But I don't know, Ed, maybe you want to comment on that? In referring to codes, I think you're talking about CPT codes, or the codes that physicians use to describe the procedures they do. And there are three, the three components of a new code, um, the relative value units. It's the work expense and the the manner in which a technology is used, the capital expense associated with the device of the technology, and the malpractice exposure. So if any of those are significantly different, then you've got an opportunity to make a case that this is not currently covered or anticipated in how they define this particular CBT code. So if this is a, dealing with a client right now, it's, um, they have an enhanced technology for doing colposcopy examinations. It's still a colposcopy, but it provides digital imaging and mapping systems that provide for more clear and accurate diagnosis and biopsy. So we're making the case that, yes, it's more expensive, there's a lot more capital expense associated with it, it's worthy of additional payment because there's more time required of the physician, and there's more capital expense, and oh, by the way, we can demonstrate long-term cost-effectiveness by more accurate biopsies uh, and or fewer biopsies so, yeah, it's worthy of being covered and paid incrementally. But then we have to get, in this case, an add-on code for it because it's something done in addition to standard colposcopy examination. 
it gets pretty technical sometimes. But if the approach is different, or the technology behind it is different, um, and you can substantiate, you know, through clinical evidence that it does what it's supposed to do, then you have an opportunity. And if the physicians in a medical specialty like it, want to make it available to those physicians who practice in that specialty, and you get their support, you have to really get them to become your advocates because they're the ones who carry the weight in talking to the AMA, which controls issuance of these new CPT codes. Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm going to Chicago for on Thursday and Friday of this week to talk to some of the medical <coughs> societies on behalf of a couple of clients, just so they know what's coming out of this technology and, and think about whether they would support um, elevating <coughs> this to a Category 1 code so it can get paid. I'd like to just maybe make a, a couple of quick comments about, about your question that I think uh, are important. I think that in an early stage medical technology company, understanding what your motives and your plans are, not only from an investor's perspective, but from a management or a board's perspective. Are you developing the technology with an exit, some, some kind of liquidity point to sell the company to go public? You know, what are your what are your motives? Because depending on what your motives are will help to drive you in an ideal or targeted regulatory reimbursement and marketing plan to achieve an early objective and milestone so that you can arrive at that liquidity point um, in the time frame that you want. So for instance, um, in that type of a scenario where, um, and I think Elizabeth was working with some venture capitalists, and venture capitalists are hungry people who see results, they want a 30x return for their money, that's what they're in there for, make dough, that's it. Um, in cases like that, when you have a product and let's say you're following a 510k pathway, the game is, is to look like the predicate. When you want to use an existing code, the game is to look like the, the, the standard. When you go to the market, you don't want to look like the predicate because now you've got to go compete against the predicate and the other benchmark for CMS. So it's kind of like wearing the face, the two-sided face of a human, you know what I'm saying? The smiley and the sad. At different times, you're going to wear a different face depending on what your objectives are. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'll just follow up on that on the uh, patent perspective. Um, that this notion of uh, wanting to be just like a predicate device uh, mm -hmm. it, it runs into problems when you're trying to get a patent on something. You're, you're telling the patent office, "Oh, you know, we're nothing like that predicate <laughs> device. We're completely different." Here's, uh, and then you've got the, uh, the regulatory folks saying, "Oh, we're completely like this predicate device." You know. Um, there's a duty of disclosure that patent applicants have to the patent office to make them aware of uh, all of the closest prior art that you're aware of. And so it's very important for your regulatory folks to be talking to your patent folks. Because uh, you've got one side talking to a, one federal agency, the FDA, saying, oh, we're just like this device. And another side of your company talking to another federal agency, the patent office, saying, oh, we're nothing like that. Um, that's brought down more than a, a few companies where you know, you've reached your, your duty of disclosure. You're, you, if your patent guy had just talked to your, your uh, FDA person and knew what was being said and, and made sure consistent things were being saying, said at the patent office, uh, it wouldn't have violated the duty of disclosure, which uh, invalidates a patent if you're, if you're not uh, coming completely clean with the, the patent office. That's great, man. That's nuts. And then you tell CMS you wanted to pay, be paid a third way. You tell the patent office it's X, you tell the FDA it's Y, and you tell CMS it's Z. That gets you. Uh, well, welcome to your government. Yeah. As long as you're talking, though. Sure. We thought this might be a follow-up question to you, Ashley. I mean, in the FDA regulatory word, world, the term is substantial equivalence. When you say it's similar, you're saying it's substantially equivalent. Well, I've had a FDA category that was defined as a plastics-based tissue patch, you know, surgical patch. The definition was plastic. And I got a bovine um, uh, material that was brought into the market under the category that was defined as plastic patch. And cows ain't plastic yet. They get me, but they're not plastic yet. And so my point is that the, the concept of substantial equivalence that drives how regulatory people say this is similar to that, um, 
it has some leeway. So I guess the question is, you know, does that help us to, you know, if we can say that that non-plastic is plastic, um, does that help you being able to say in a patent, aha, unlike any other patch, we're now out of animal, so we're patenting animal-based patches. So I, I just, I don't know if you have any other comments you can have. I, I haven't actually dealt with bumping into this with patents, but I just know that there's a substantial equivalence, um, can be very broad, and other times, the slightest difference in FDA will say it's not substantially equivalent. Well, it used to be when we were citing uh, prior references to the patent office, you'd explain all the differences and the similarities and talk about them. Now we just, uh, you know, to keep the record clean, just cite them. You, here, you need to be aware of this, um, this prior art predicate device, uh, or maybe even statements we're making to the FDA, you need to be aware of it. Uh, it really is a case-by-case -case basis on, on what you do there. But from the patent side of things, it's just uh, a, the standard is uh, materiality. It, is this predicate device material to the patentability of um, the claims you're going after in this current patent application? And if you're anywhere close, it seems material. You just cite it to the patent office, and you don't have to make much of a distinction. Let me just go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The, the other thing about FDA's regulatory standpoint is um, you, know, you need to be substantially equivalent, which can be interpreted narrowly or broadly by the agency. And then, any differences do not raise new questions of safety and effectiveness that you, know, you haven't addressed you know, the potential problems with you know, testing. So you can be different, and you can even be better as long as you're not raising new kinds of safety and effectiveness questions. So um, I'm just, again, talking here about how that might still, you know, you can still be different in regulatory, support different in a patent, and not have the agency immediately reject your product. Uh, and then the other thing, though, is again, we've got this de novo. So you can have absolutely brand new technology. I mean, it could be made out of, you know, brand new materials, brand new intended news, everything could be different. And you could still be at the noble 510K. So in some ways, I think the issue has um, dissipated. Because obviously with a PMA, you can be as different as you want, because FDA is brand new. But now with the de novo 510K, I suppose the point is, it doesn't matter how different you are, as long as you can be at class one, class two at a risk level. So maybe to some extent, since the de novo has come out, Maybe this issue, but the only, the only reason the issue wouldn't dissipate is sometimes you can still be very different and still be within a traditional 510K where you're still doing the dance of we're the same. But again, I think there are ways maybe with the different interpretations of substantial equivalence from the regulatory standpoint in terms of the impact, which is are you different and you raise new questions of safety and effectiveness. Or if you do, you've got to put them to rest, in which case, you're still different, but you're saying the differences don't create a problem from the agency standpoint. So I guess, I'm, and again, I haven't bump, bumped into this in my own practice, um, where I've had patent people you know, interacting with me, but this seems like, you know, there, there could be a way that you can be different for the patents and still not be so different that you get in trouble with the agency. <coughs> 